Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and I'm going to present part six today of my series on the selected gross pathology of the liver and biliary tree. And part six is going to concentrate on nutritional and toxicologic disease of the liver. There are a tremendous number of changes seen in the liver with a variety of nutritional diseases and toxic injuries, but we're going to focus on the ones that cause gross changes in the appearance of the liver. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who provided me images, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Okay, let's start with nutritional diseases. It's a great picture from John King and a very small liver in a dog. If you compare it to the size of the gallbladder, you see actually how small this liver is, and there's no fat in any of the attachments. And remember that starvation can result in an overall decrease in the size of the liver, as well as histologically the size of the hepatocytes, because they're just simply not getting the components that they need to be healthy and a normal size. Starvation is a lack of total nutrients over time. When we talk about malnutrition, we're looking at the deficiency of a single or multiple nutrients or an imbalance of nutrients which cause disease. This particular liver is about two-thirds of normal size. Here's a great picture uh, of a very small liver in a young dog with microvascular dysplasia or a congenital hypoplasia of the portal vein. Remember, all of the ingredients needed to keep the liver happy and healthy and functioning properly come through the portal system from the intestine. A combination of calories, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and cytokines. In animals with congenital microvascular dysplasia, or even some intra or extrapatic portal shunting, all of those necessary nutrients bypass the liver. This will eventually cause a number of problems for the animal, and much more than just a small liver. The liver detoxifies the blood, and eventually a number of components are going to build up, especially ammonia, which is going to cause problems in other parts of the body, including the brain. Histologically, if you examine the portal triads in these cases, you will see that the portal arteries have become tortuous, and there will be multiple cross-sections, and you may see bile ducts but you won't see any profiles of portal veins. In fact, because the liver is small, at low magnifications, the portal triads may seem very close to each other. Don't confuse this with cirrhosis of the liver or macronodular hyperplasia with fibrosis, which may result in an overall decrease in size of the liver. But those animals have hypertension of the portal vein, generally due to occlusion of uh, its tributaries and difficult blood through and cholestasis within the liver due to deposition of fibrous connective tissue, which interrupts proper blood flow, nutrition resulting in hypertension and forcing the uh, body to open up anastomoses, which are vestigial in nature, not usually used in order to move the blood around the liver, which is acting as a stopgap to the flow of blood. So congenital microvascular dysplasia and microhepatica, which is another term for a very small liver, will be seen in young animals. And then cirrhosis is usually seen in middle-aged to older animals. There are a lot of diseases of various uh, vitamin deficiencies or excesses that will cause damage to the liver. A lot of them will cause a very 
you know, similar change, uh, including hepatic lipidosis. We've talked about how sick hepatocytes can take in fat, but they can't get rid of it. I think the classic disease of vitamin imbalance is seen in pigs with an imbalance of vitamin E and selenium. This disease, known as hepatosis dietetica, is a disease of young, rapidly growing pigs with a combination of imbalances or deficiencies in vitamin E and selenium, both very potent antioxidants, as well as a decrease or inadequate dietary protein, especially sulfur-containing amino acids. In affected pigs, you see massive hepatic necrosis. When I use the term massive, it's really a histologic term, uh, which implies that there is necrosis in all parts of the lobule, central lobular, mid-zonal, and periportal. When we get into the toxins, we'll see that some, on a histologic basis, will hit the central lobular hepatocytes. Some may hit the periportal hepatocytes, but vitamin E selenium deficiency results in necrosis of the entire lobule. As you see here, there are areas of hemorrhage, which actually represent large confluent areas of necrosis. Some of the liver doesn't look too bad, but overall, you can see there is a marked decrease or massive necrosis in the liver because look how floppy this liver it is. It isn't the normal, robust, healthy, sort of blunt-ended. It's sort of this wet dish rag. And you can see the size of the edematous gallbladder here showing how much of the hepatic parenchyma has been lost in this case. We know that uh, uh, vitamin E and selenium are both potent antioxidants and are necessary to protect uh, delicate membranes against free radicals that have been generated. And, and you increase the amount of free radicals by increasing the, uh, the amount of uh, fat in the diet. So high-fat diets also put additional stress on the liver. And when we exhaust the supplies of vitamin E and selenium, then marked necrosis will occur as a result of peroxidation of hepatocellular organelle membranes. Here's another case of hepatosis dietetica showing the hemorrhage and necrosis. Not all animals succumb to this. Some may get, continue with replenishment of vitamin E and selenium and a boost of protein to the diet and will develop uh, post-necrotic scarring. Another manifestation of vitamin E selenium deficiency which may be seen in young pigs is mulberry heart disease due to a severe vasculitis and then other diseases that are associated with vitamin deficiencies are a microangiopathic -angi uh, vasculitis which is seen in older animals as well. Affected animals may also demonstrate uh, necrosis within skeletal muscles. And here's a really nice old picture uh, from Dr. David Dodd, um, which shows a couple of things associated with uh, hepatosis dietetica. We don't see the hemorrhage as we've seen in the other pictures. You can see that the normal uh, fibrosis, which outlines the lobules very nicely in pigs, is even more enhanced in this case because of necrosis and collapse of the parenchyma. And you can also see the blanching. The entire liver is, is blanched. It's not that normal, healthy, reddish brown color we expect. And then some of these lobules have large areas of visible necrosis at subgross magnification, um, which would be associated with uh, hepatosis dietetica, or a number of other toxins, which we're going to talk about in the next part of this lecture when it comes to pigs. Here's another lesion which will cause uh, gross uh, lipidosis in pigs, and that's cobalt deficiency. 
This is a condition which is known as white liver disease and is seen in the U.S. and Australia, generally in small ruminants grazing cobalt-deficient pastures. And one of the classic conditions is that these animals are, are on pastures which previously uh, were growing potatoes or have potato stubble because potatoes uh, really leach cobalt out of the soil. And it's well known that uh, you need a lot of cobalt fertilizer if you're growing potatoes. Cobalt is usually incorporated into vitamin B12 by uh, microbes in the rumen. So these animals are generally vitamin B12 deficient as well. The histologic lesion is a hepatocellular accumulation of lipid, especially in central lobular areas, as well as a tremendous amount of seroid or lipofusion within hepatocytes. And eventually, these, an these animals will progress to liver failure uh, with a, a jaundice of the tissues and spongy degeneration within the cerebrum as a result of hyperaminemia. Okay, let's move on to some of the toxicologic diseases that affect domestic species. Okay, here is the uh, viscera from a dog. The first thing that you can see is the liver is a diffuse yellow color. The gallbladder is bigger than it should be because this liver exhibits massive necrosis. Look how floppy it is. It's not the normal color. So this yellow is not really lipid. It's more massive necrosis. And you can see some hemorrhages within the uh, pulmonary parenchyma, probably because the liver is where all of the uh, uh, proteins are made for coagulation. So when you go into liver failure, uh, eventually, if you live long enough, um, you won't be able to clot. You'll probably go into DIC on top of everything else. Now in the dog, there are a number of toxins that can do this, but in dogs, primarily in the south, east and south central United States, there is a particular type of mushroom called amanita, which causes massive hepatic necrosis due to inhibition of nuclear RNA polymerase, which interferes ultimately with transcription and inhibits protein synthesis. Here's another picture of amanita poisoning, showing the marked hepatic necrosis, loss of hepatocytes, depression, and I bet we could uh, flop this uh, uh, liver around because the, the borders just look too narrow to me. Now, uh, there are a lot of other toxins that will cause massive hepatic necrosis in dogs. It's a fairly long list. Um, Probably topping the list is acetaminophen, which will do the same thing in cats and many other animal species. Cats are especially susceptible because they cannot metabolize it. And uh, ultimately, the damage there is caused by the liberation of large amounts of toxic free radicals, the exhaustion of glu glutathione reductase, and a lesion quite similar to and pathogenesis to what we saw in hepatosis dietetica, just tremendous liberation and damage to hepatocellular membranes. Other toxins that will cause massive necrosis, uh, carprofen, amodirone, uh, mebendazole is one that we don't see very much. A new one on the... Uh, uh, just on the horizon, an emerging toxicity is xylitol, which is a uh, sweetener. It's a non-sugar sweetener that's used in breath mints and, and gum and can be extremely toxic to dogs. There are some, uh, some idiosyncratic reactions to antibiotics, including trimethoprim sulfa and uh, one of the classic uh, uh, anesthesia agents, halothane, would occasionally cause this type of massive necrosis in the dog. So the list is long, um, so at least know a couple that are on there. Okay, here's an absolute classic. If I tell you that this is a sheep, okay, this sort of brownish discoloration um, is not, once again, it's not a lipid. This is due to uh, marked hepatic necrosis, and this is sort of the color. There's a range of colors from from yellow brown to uh, to sort of a putty color, almost a gray color that you will see in sheep that have been intoxicated with copper. 
Uh, sheep don't, uh, they do not tolerate copper well. Um, you can see when, uh, see this particular condition when fields have been top dressed with fertilizer containing copper, or if sheep get into horse feed or even machinery where horse feed has been made because uh, horses take a lot more copper in their feed and it's too much for sheep. You can also see this in other ruminants as well, but sheep are the ones that are particularly susceptible to copper toxicity. Also, watch out for sheep that are in uh, uh, old abandoned barns or something like that because they may chew on copper pipes or copper wires as well. And the liver of the sheep basically binds copper. Um, it absorbs it and it binds it and it's bound to metallothionines. And when all of these are overwhelmed, eventually a little bit of copper is going to make its way into the nucleus and it's going to set off the caspase cascade resulting in apoptosis. Okay, then what happens? All that copper is liberated. Some of it's taken up by Cooper cells. A lot of it will go into the bloodstream. And when you get enough copper in the bloodstream, you're going to result, this will result in hemolysis. Okay, and then you get these, these, this vicious cycle of cycles of uh, anemia, shock, hepatic, hypoxia. Remember those central lobular parasites are always on the razor's edge of hypoxia. And you drop the PCV a little bit and you go kill off more hepatocytes and then go and liberate more copper. Then you get more hemolysis. So you get over a period of, of 12 to 24 hours, you get these repeating cycles of hemolysis and hepatic necrosis releasing more copper. Here's another one of those copper livers from a sheep. Note the large gallbladder denoting the small size of the liver and the fact that while it's sort of yellow and you're going to think about lipidosis, look how it's just floppy. It's lost most of the parenchyma here. Um, there are other things in the diet that are very important uh, in terms of protecting sheep from uh, copper toxicity. Uh, sulfates and molybdenum often form insoluble complexes with copper in the gut and allow it to be passed out. So if the diet is low in those two components, you may have an increased amount of uh, copper toxicity. Okay, certain, certain plants like subterranean clover um, are deficient molybdenum. So uh, the animals that graze it will accumulate copper. And then if you have other hepatotoxins um, in the diet, even in low amounts, like pyrolizidine alkaloids, which are so common, or maybe fomopsin or something like that, that will add to the uh, difficulty in the liver, you know, hanging on to that copper and initiate the necrosis that starts that vicious cycle. The carcass of these animals is ye usually yellow due to icterus, and then we'll have the classic lesion that's associated with copper toxicity. I know we're not doing kidney today, but I want you to see the bluish black color that is associated with the accumulation of hemoglobin within the tubules of affected uh, sheep. And uh, the hemoglobin is released as a result of these periodic waves of hemolysis. And this is a very characteristic lesion of copper toxicity. There's also one bacterium that will do this, very rare in sheep. That's a Clostridium perfringens type A, which contains a hemolysin. But when you see blue-black kidneys in a sheep, a goat, or maybe even a cow, you want to think of, of copper toxicity at your, uh, 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 as at the top of your list. Hemoglobin usually doesn't cause a whole lot of, of damage to the kidney, but uh, it can interact, uh, the liberated heme proteins will interact with TAM horsefall protein that is mildly tops, toxic to the tubular epithelium. What usually kills these animals is the severe anemia and shock that is going on in them. That's what also causes most of the damage in the kidneys, not the, the free hemoglobin. Okay, let's look at some other uh, uh, just interesting and uh, it probably is in sort of random order here. Uh, this is, and I always have trouble with these livers. This is liver from a pig and there is uh, marked necrosis. Sometimes I get confused and I will think about lipidosis, but what we're looking at is we're looking at the lobules and all of these sort of reddish areas are areas of necrosis. 
This is due to cockle burr toxicity. There's a number of, and I said before, I would give you some rule outs for hepatosis dietetica. And when we get into some of the, uh, the toxins that you'll see, um, cockle burr or xanthium, Toxicity. It's a weed that generally grows in, in ditches and lower marshy areas. Um, and it does have the seedlings, if they're affected, will cause massive necrosis in pigs that graze them. They'll also get uh, uh, similar toxicity from uh, clay pigeons if people are skeet shooting or coal tar, especially old roofing on houses will have coal tar. It will give you a very similar picture to hepatosis dietetica. Here's a liver from a dog, and the liver is uh, diffusely sort of yellow. You can see it's a, a little flabby. There is lipid accumulation here. There's loss of parenchyma, and this is due to aflatoxin administration. We don't think of dogs as getting a lot of aflatoxicosis. You think more of it is sort of a, a, a disease of production animals on spoiled feed, but you can have the exact same thing because the... Uh, uh, Mycotoxin, or the, the molds that produce uh, as, aflatoxin, um, Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus parasiticus, and some penicilliums um, will grow in moldy kibble or something like that. So food that's been wet and stored improperly can result in outbreaks of aflatoxin uh, as well uh, in dogs as in you know, larger animals or ruminants. Okay, so these, uh, when, when uh, uh, formed on cereal grains, these molds will produce a number of, of toxins. Um, four major toxins of which uh, aflatoxin B1 is the, uh, one of the greatest significance. And generally it forms a conjugate with glutathione. Um, but when glutathione as transferase levels are exhausted, um, unconjugated uh, aflatoxin B1 will bind to macromolecules, especially nucleic acids, both in, in the uh, in nuclear proteins in the mitochondria, and result in necrosis of uh, hepatocytes. It's also carcinogenic as well, so it can get you in a number of ways. And uh, as I look at this particular slide, I don't think it's a dog at all. I think this one was mislabeled in my collection because I see this pattern. I think this is actually a uh, it's actually a pig because that's just sort of this sort of uh, texture to it which is the uh, presence of the fibrous connective tissue around the lobules i can see areas of hemorrhage and necrosis and i can see the uh, the accumulation of lipid here remember sick hepatocytes will accumulate lipid so it's not uncommon histologically in a lot of these toxins to see a lot of lipid lipid laden uh, hepatocytes. Mammals aren't the only uh, the only animals to develop aflatoxicosis. You can also see it in uh, poultry as well. It's actually very similar. Young animals are are more predisposed um, to developing uh, aflatoxicosis, and you have a combination of multifocal hepatic necrosis and hemorrhage, and sort of a diffuse lipidosis. Of the uh, of the remaining hepatocytes, which will characterize aflatoxicosis. Here's another fun one from a recent Wednesday slide conference um, that results in different parts of, of massive hepatic necrosis in different parts of the world due to different types of sawfly larva. The toxins that you see in sawflies in South America are very different than the toxins that you see in the sawflies in Europe. In Australia, sawfly uh, uh, toxicity is the result of uh, ingesting, and you'll always find little parts of these larvae within the rumen, but you ingest the uh, Lophyrotoma interrupta. In Europe, it's Arga pulata, and in South America, it's yet another sawfly, Perea flavipes. But in all areas where uh, it occurs, it can cause important livestock losses as a result of the massive hepatic necrosis that you see. Very interestingly, you can, I, you can uh, concentrate the toxins from these 
these uh, uh, three different uh, insect larvae, and they cause different regional necrosis when they, you inject them into laboratory animals, with some causing uh, periportal necrosis, some causing central larval necrosis, but the usual picture in affected ruminants is going to be massive hepatic necrosis and uh, liver failure. Okay, contrast the livers that we've seen before um, with some of the next ones that we see, which indicate the livers are shrunken. There's a lot of fibrous connective tissue, which indicate more of a chronic toxicity, more of a serotic change. And as we start looking at cirrhosis in some of these cases, um, there's a big difference between cirrhosis that we see in dogs, where you get this sort of lumpy, bumpy, macronodular, hepatic regenerative change and fibrosis with what we tend to see in ruminants or horses where the entire liver becomes very fibrotic and tends to shrink. Um, so I'll start with uh, a, a fairly common toxin in many parts of the world for ruminants, and this is uh, sporodesmin, a toxin which is produced by the fungus Pithomyces chartar chartarum. It grows most often in ryegrass pastures, especially on, uh, on the, the dead uh, ryegrass. And it's seen in many parts of, of the world in ruminants and camelids, including Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, and, and even in parts of the United States. And these animals, due to the chronic uh, uh, loss of functional uh, hepatocytes, will develop uh, photosensitivity and a condition known as facial eczema. The toxin sporodesmin primarily targets uh, large and medium-sized intra and extrahepatic bile ducts, and these bile ducts become uh, attenuated or completely occluded in severe cases. The changes in these ducts histologically are, are almost pathognomonic for sporodesmin. Uh, toxicity, as is the, the portal fibrosis um, and the biliary ductural hyperplasia that accompanies it. In a gross change that's not uncommon with a lot of these toxins, um, the ruminant liver, the lesions tend to affect the left lobe more severely than the right lobe. And, and the use of the term left and right I always found sort of funny because the way that the liver is primarily situated, the left lobes are, are hanging down. They really should call them the ventral lobes. And uh, uh, the right lobes are sort of up. And I don't know whether uh, it just has to do with the fact that you have a bit better blood flow um, in the more ventral parts. They're a little bit more congested, tend to be more exposed to toxins like that. Um, that's my explanation. I don't think you'll find that one in any book. But in really severe cases, these left lobes can be markedly atrophic. And the liver can actually look just like a big right lobe with very little of the uh, left lobe uh, remaining. This is a really nice picture by uh, Dr. Resendez. But it just shows you how the liver in, in chronic intoxications in, in sheep and goats and, and cattle and horses just sort of shrinks down. It contracts due to tremendous fibrosis. It becomes very whitish, very hard. You can hit somebody in the head with it and knock them out. Whereas in the dog, it tends to, uh, tends to form these large uh, lumps and bumps all over it. So not all cirrhosis in all species looks alike. Here's an, another uh, small liver, big gallbladder. Maybe the animal has not been eating very well. And you can see that there is necrosis here because that the liver lobe, this one doesn't look too bad, but this one, there's just no tissue left. It's just complete stromal collapse. And there's a condition known as uh, lantana poisoning in the ox. And, and in this particular case, you often get this big whitish gallbladder with a sort of a thick, uh, viscous uh, bile. Usually these animals are ictric, they have, and they have severe cholestasis with photosensitization because uh, lantana is a really pretty uh, ornamental shrub with beautiful little flowers. And, uh, but unfortunately, those mask uh, some very toxic uh, uh, triterpenes that are, I guess, how it protects itself. 
It causes a, a functional uh, severe intrahepatic cholestasis because it targets the, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the cells lying in the biocanaliculi. And the biocanaliculi sort of collapse on themselves. These animals really quickly develop a, a severe liver disease and photosensitization and jaundice within days after consuming uh, lantana. It also will cause uh, uh, severe mild myocardial necrosis in affected animals as well. This just get back to the gallbladder. Some people say that there is gallbladder distension as a result um, to sort of paralysis by the toxins that lantana produces. Um, it's sort of the outgrowth of that uh, that biliary ductular collapse that you see. So a lot of cholestasis, uh, hepatic damage, and this huge gallbladder characteristic for lantana toxicity. Oh, here's another one that also sort of bridges the gap between acute and chronic toxicity and uh, these sort of white areas, areas of hepatocellular loss. And this is one of a number of signs that you'll see as a result of uh, exposure to Gossipol. Gossipol is often seen in, in, in animals that have had excessive amounts of cottonseed meal, used as a protein supplement. I always marvel to people who decide that they get extra protein in the diet um, and they use some toxic compounds to do it. And you can see hepatic necrosis, you can see cardiac necrosis. Um, uh, dogs that get into Gossipol often have large areas of, uh, of cardiac necrosis. In the liver, Gossipol either can cause direct damage to hepatocytes or um, can result in the liberation of uh, large amounts of toxic free radicals from other phenolic compounds in the diet. It also inhibits glutathione as transferase as well. So the mechanism is very similar to the other toxins where the liver's damage, the sort of fragile membranes of hepatocellular organelles are damaged by the liberation of free radicals. But Gossipol is one of those compounds that can uh, go after a number of organs in the body. Probably not a good idea to use too much cottonseed meal. Okay, now we've gone on to cirrhosis in the dog, which I think most people in their mind has the idea of the classic form of cirrhosis. Also look, will look like this in uh, people as well. Just remember, in, in production animals and horses, it just tends to shrink without giving you sort of this bulbous appearance. Okay, so... The classic uh, injury that results in this disease is very simple. The ingestion or injection or administration of a very small amount of toxin over a long period of time. Enough to kill some hepatocytes, not enough to cause widespread necrosis and kill the animal outright. And there are a lot of things, tremendous things that will do this, including anticonvulsants, medications will do this, uh, plant toxins will do this, uh, algal toxins, aflatoxin, pyrolizine, a lot of things will cause um, this type of damage in the liver. When you damage hepatocytes, the way I explain the formation of these large uh, uh, sort of, of areas of macronagia. Uh, regeneration is when you damage and kill off hepatocytes. The liver has a tremendous uh, way to reconstitute itself and it just regrows like nobody's business. But when you damage hepatocytes, you switch on not only the hepatocytes, which will regrow, but you also switch on uh, pluripotent cells, which will differentiate into fibroblasts and put down fibrous connective tissue at the same time that these hepatocytes are regenerating themselves. So you know, they're forming islands of new hepatocytes, and then the fibrosis comes around the outside and sort of walls them off. Okay, so you get this macronodular regeneration. I think that in the production animals, maybe um, they don't regenerate their hepatocytes quite as bit. So the fibrosis always wins that battle. Okay, but the problem is with this fibrosis and these, these uh, 
uh, regenerative nodules. The fibrosis constricts blood, throw, blood flow through the liver and biliary drainage. And eventually, you have these two processes competing. Um, and over a period of years, the animal will develop uh, liver disease, clinical liver disease, and liver failure. Histologically, you always see a lot of fibrous connective tissue around these nodules. Um, but the, one of the classic signs that shows that the animal is probably never going to come back from this insult is when you start to see uh, little strands of fibrous connective tissue around individual hepatocytes. And that is a problem. The thing about cirrhosis is, in just about any animal species, you almost never figure out what causes it, unless you have a history that the animal's been on anticonvulsant drugs or something like that for a long period of time or some anti-inflammatory drugs. But in most cases, it just sort of sneaks up on you, and it is well established. Um, just do the normal day-to-day -day diet or whatever, and and it's very, it's a great lesion to see on the autopsy floor, but you almost never figure out what caused it and causes great consternation to the owners when that happens. Um, when we look at the dog, um, we looked at all these potential toxins, but there's other things that will do it as well. Um, you can have chronic extrahepatic biliary obstruction that will do it. You could have uh, severe cardiac disease, um, copper intoxication, the inability to, uh, uh, to excrete copper in the dog. Um, that's always a tough one to, uh, to, to tell in the late stages of cirrhosis because has the animal always been accumulating copper? Is it one of those breeds that like to accumulate copper like Bedlingtons and Labradors or whatever? Or because of the changes in the infrastructure of the liver due to cirrhosis? Is it accumulating copper abnorm abnormally. So that's a tough one. Um, there have been reports that uh, chronic infection with canine adenovirus type 1 might cause this. I'm not too much sure about that. But what we do know is that you have up to six times as much collagen in these livers as you have in the normal liver. And then they will progress into a hepatic failure. So you will see... Um, um, severe portal hypertension, you'll see opening up of, uh, of secondary shunts uh, to get blood around this big mass of fibrous connective tissue. Um, they will develop icterus. And it's interesting that you don't see a lot of icterus in these animals, maybe because it's such a slow progression. It takes years for them to get to this part. But you rarely see icterus uh, in association with most of these cases of cirrhosis, they may develop coagulopathies. As we talked before, the uh, the liver is where all of the proteins for coagulation are made. And in these uh, sort of starved livers, they can neither make them because they're just not getting the proteins there that they need because the blood is being shunted around it, nor could they release them if they could make it. So coagulopathy may be a presenting sign in some of these cases. Oh, just a couple more pictures to show you on cut section. Here's that, those regenerative nodules and these large areas. This whole thing's a little yellow, so maybe this animal was a little ectric, but these large bands of fibrosis, which are, uh, are separating, are preventing uh, bile from flowing properly and preventing a lot of the, uh, the normal circulation of the liver. And here's a, a nice one in situ. Okay, the liver's probably smaller than normal, but don't confuse that with the congenital microvascular dysplasias, which we see in puppies, because they don't have a, uh, a developed, they have hypoplasia of their portal vein. These animals have had a portal vein their entire life, but there is just so much fibrosis in the liver that the blood can't flow out of it to nourish the rest of the liver. Okay, so if you have severe portal hypertension, here's a, a bad-looking small liver, very nodular. Um, you will open up to get blood around that liver and nourish the rest of the body. You can't just leave all the blood here in the caudal vena cava behind the liver. So it's going to get out. It's going to get to the rest of the body by opening up 
these uh, vestigial shots. They, are, they were present early in life, and they shut down, and the body has a way of opening them back up to form portosystemic anastomoses. And you can see these in, uh, in the azygous vein. Uh, you can see it in the uh, shunts between the portal vein, the vena cava, the costal veins, the splenic veins, and even the renal veins will open back up in ways to develop new circulation to get the blood that backs up in the portal vein around this liver. Now that's not going to be good for the liver because all the blood flow coming out of the intestine, as we saw before, which nourishes the liver and all of the, ve the various growth factors coming out of the liver or coming out of the intestine cannot nourish the liver. The liver itself is going to shrink. It's going to get worse and you're going to get buildup of certain substances like ammonia that the liver normally takes out of circulation, which eventually is going to cause hyperammonemia and uh, nervous signs. When you look at the portal triads, you're going to see uh, profiles of those portal veins. There's not going to be a lot of flow through them, but you will see them as opposed to what you see in the microvascular dysplasia, which, where you don't see them at all. And you can even see these in large animals too. They're not just uh, they are not just a, a thing that dogs will do and cats will do. You can see them in uh, in large animals with cirrhosis because this liver is discolored and full of fibrous connective tissue. Oh, here's another uh, here's another interesting clinical finding that you may see in animals with severe hepatic disease, and and here we have hyperkeratosis of the paw pads, also known as hepatocutaneous syndrome. This has been seen with in a number of uh, diseases of either the pancreas or the liver. I think as time goes by, we tend to see more diseases associated with chronic liver disease. And it's thought that maybe it has to do with... Um, well, the thought is that uh, it, this is probably a cutaneous manifestation of uh, liver disease, um, decreased metabolism of some vital uh, amino acids, and, and quote-unquote nutritional starvation of the skin. It's a really nice histologic lesion with a, a combination of uh, uh, hyperkeratosis, uh, edema of the stramspongiosum, and the uh, uh, proliferation of basal layers giving the characteristic uh, red, white, and blue appearance um, based on your nationality. You could say that it's the American flag, or you could say it's the French flag, or a number of other flags as well. well this hepatocutaneous syndrome um, seen with cirrhosis as well as various tumors of the liver and the pancreas. Just a couple more pictures of cirrhosis. This one sort of straddles. This is a ruminant liver, and uh, you got a little bit of macronodular hepatic regeneration. And when you cut through that, boy, look at all the fibrous connective tissue and how little actual functional liver is left. It's amazing how dense these uh, cow livers or horse livers can be with uh, chronic hepatotoxin administration. And here's another one. Okay, look at all the fibrous connective tissue uh, on this liver. So, you know, plant toxins, another very unrewarding. There's 350 uh, plants in Texas alone, according to uh, Dr. Stromberg, um, who does occasionally tell some tall tales, but he's probably right on on this one. Um, and there's so many toxic plants out there that uh, ruminants will get into. Most of them probably don't taste that good, but if the grazing is, uh, the grazing is, is not good, they will eat just about anything in real dry parts of the year. Here is a cirrhosis in an Amazon parrot. And the cirrhosis is very characteristic of older uh, birds with hepatic disease. Uh, Cytosines tend to get it on a fairly regular basis. Once again, not usually uh, readily identifiable as to the cause. So great lesions. Uh, rather unsatisfying as to uh, identifying the uh, identifying the particular agent that caused this over a period of many years. 
Here's a nice cut through a cirrhotic liver from a horse. This is, uh, and you really can't tell what the lesion is. You can see the, the tremendous bridging fibrosis, um, which is the white outlines around the uh, little areas of remaining hepatocytes and congestion. This is pyrolizidine alkaloid toxicity. So many different plants have this. Um, and uh, various uh, animal species have different susceptibilities to pyrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, pigs are the most susceptible, followed by horses, followed by cattle, and then finally the small room in sheep and goats. Sheep can graze out toxic plants that would be lethal to cattle. So uh, there is some species uh, uh, difference. And uh, the toxicity is, in, with all the pyrolizidine alkaloids, is the uh, alkylation reaction between uh, uh, the pyrrole esters and the proteins of the, uh, the nucleus and the mitochondria as well, and it forms these uh, adducts. And when these adducts occur in the, uh, in the nucleus, um, it inhibits uh, mitosis. Um, but the animals are able, it doesn't inhibit DNA synthesis, and so they get these megalocytes. They get uh, these really large cells with huge nuclei because they just can't, uh, they can't get into mitosis. Uh, usually you get severe fibroplasia, uh, especially in horses, uh, bridging portal to portal fibroplasia, and biliary proliferation, just fluorid proliferation. Sometimes you look at it and say, oh my gosh, it's all bile ducts in here. Um, and you don't see that in the sheep, um, but you re and a little bit in the cattle, but the horses, it's, it's extremely profound. Just another couple cases from the, uh, uh, from the Wednesday slide conference. This was 2015, and the write-up uh, from this particular slide said that over 6,000 plants around the world produce pyrolizine alkaloids. So it's pretty common, uh, a pretty common cause of liver damage, uh, cirrhosis, hepatitis, photosensitivity, and maybe even liver failure in animals. And once again, another horse picture showing the uh, dramatic biliary hyperplasia and some, some uh, fibrosis in between these nodules of, uh, of hepatocytes. Hey, we can play, uh, we can play Guess That Toxin again. Um, we've talked about this one before. I just want to mention that uh, um, in addition to aflatoxin B1 causing marked hepatic necrosis, and we have hepatic necrosis, lipidosis, and actually some discoloration due to cholestasis, it can often, as uh, in the picture of this foal by uh, Dr. Paul Stromberg, can cause uh, neoplasia as well. It tends to uh, get into the nuclear mitochondrial DNA, as do most of these toxins, and it causes adducts with guanosine, and you can inactivate uh, p53 and other tumor suppressive genes, uh, giving rise to uh, hepatic tumors, especially uh, cholangiocarcinomas in certain species like ducks and hamsters, hepatocellular carcinomas in mammals. Um, so it does a wide range of, of liver tumors as well. And this is a foal and has both uh, the necrotizing lesions associated with uh, aflatoxin and tumors in the liver. Okay, well, those are, those are toxins, some of the common toxins that attack the liver. How about some other diseases which are sort of toxic but more characterized by fibrosis? Could be uh, histologically, it would be on your rule-out list uh, when you look at uh, uh, some of these fibrotic livers. This is the liver from uh, a minor bird. And uh, you can see that the liver is somewhat nodular. It's very firm. It is discolored. And minor birds, along with a number of other bird species, including uh, uh, birds of paradise, are very prone to develop hemochromatosis. We can also see that in some mammalian species, uh, including rock hyraxes. And you tend to see a lot of uh, iron in a number of exotic species that are seen in zoos. Um, and the reason that we see this type of iron accumulation is because probably we do not recapitulate the diets these animals eat in the wild. And whereas they may eat some type of food 
normally when they're living in the, the jungle and, and living up in the treetops um, that may form a lot of adducts with iron. Um, they tend to not, we, we don't know, you know, precisely what they're eating, so we can't get that vital uh, factor to them. And so they tend to deposit a tremendous amount of iron. Now, some species like reptiles and amphibians, they will have uh, sort of uh, heme pigment complexes, complexes of melanin and iron and all that as a normal product. And those increase with age. But, but there are a number of species that are well known for um, hemochromatosis. And when you get that amount of, of iron in your liver, you're going to develop a lot of fibrous connective tissue. There's going to be hepatocellular damage and loss. Um, there's a condition of siderosis, which is the normal accumulation of iron in the liver. And then you have hemochromatosis, where the amount of iron is so large that it causes hepatocellular damage and necrosis. It's a true pathologic condition. And there are a number of species like mine and birds that, uh, that you want to think about um, when it comes to hemochromatosis. Um, there have been uh, cases of toxicity, iron toxicity over the years. Um, there was a very famous case back in the uh, early 1980s of a marketed iron supplement for foals, which just had way too much iron in it called Prima Paste. And you would administer this to the foal orally, and it just absolutely blew out their liver. So too much iron, little iron's fine. Too much iron can be very damaging to the liver, and hemochromatosis is the result of that. We also see hemochromatosis in people. Um, there were uh, a number of, it was a chronic disease in the Bantu population in, uh, in uh, South Africa because they would uh, make beer in these iron pots, and they would boil it up, and they would get great beer, and they would get tremendous amount of iron, too, and they very high rate of hemochromatosis. Um, Another condition that uh, may mimic uh, iron deposition, may mimic cirrhosis, give you this nodular appearance to the liver, is, uh, is copper toxicity. Um, there are a number of breeds of dogs which accumulate excessive amounts of copper within, uh, within the hepatocytes. And usually it's due to a defect in the MER1 gene, which produces a protein intended uh, or that's necessary for parasites to excrete copper. So they don't have the protein. They accumulate all this copper. Eventually, it will overwhelm the normal metallothions, which it binds to in the parasites. It will get into the nucleus and will initiate apoptosis, as we talked about as part of the, uh, the pathogenesis for copper toxicity. And the, most of these breeds are well-known. Uh, Bedlington Terriers seem to be the ones that get the highest level of uh, of copper if copper normally copper in a, in a dog liver is about 400 parts per million bedlingtons can can break 12,000 um dalmatians uh, westies labradors sky terriers dobermans cockers all of these are other other dog breeds that have been well documented as accumulating copper realize that any non-specific injury you may have copper accumulation which you can demonstrate histologically in paraportal hepatocytes it's just a uh, part of a pathogenesis of a wide range of hepatotoxicities, but when you start to see this massive amount um, in all areas of the hepatic lobby, you have to think about a uh, inherited copper excretion defect. One other thing that uh, uh, will cause a lot of fibrosis has nothing to do with copper or iron is a uh, a condition known as lobular dissecting hepatitis in young dogs, and they just put down a tremendous amount of a fibrous connective tissue, and you see it dissecting. It's called dissecting hepatitis because it gets in between the hepatocytes. When you start wrapping the individual hepatocytes with fibrous connective tissue, that c carries a very poor prognosis. Um, this lobular dissecting uh, hepatitis is most often seen in uh, standard poodles and rottweilers and cocker spaniels. And nobody knows exactly what causes it. Seems to be very similar to a, a condition in uh, uh, in humans um, of idiopathic hepatic fibrosis as well. So I would think about that. Um, 
people say, well, you know, it, it's the size of these nodules. Uh, the regular cirrhosis has really big nodules, and this one has much smaller nodules. Is, is copper, the nodules associated with copper smaller? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, uh, you can see a cirrhosis for other causes just not have those profound uh, areas of macronodular uh, hepatocellular regeneration and the copper accumulation can have them. So let's not ascribe too much significance to the size of the nodules in these particular cases. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna put one more actually this great picture from uh, my good friend Dr. Mike Garner and this is veno occlusive disease. This is the uh, liver from a a cheetah and and venoclusive disease is a condition that's seen in people associated with the various forms of birth control. Um, and it's been seen in uh, snow leopards and cheetahs in captivity. Um, and it's has been associated by Dr. Linda Munson with the use of long-term contraception. You get uh, sort of a, a central lobular proliferation of, uh, of collagen which dissects between hepatocytes and obviously can cause some significant problems with uh, the normal circulation of blood through the liver. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the nutritional, toxic, and fibrosing diseases of the liver. We're getting down to the end of the diseases of the liver parenchyma. We have one more lecture on... Uh, on the hepatic parenchyma, where we're going to look at the tumors and uh, other neoplasm-like lesions of the liver. And then we will finish up this series of lectures with uh, diseases of the biliary tree, which will be one or, or maybe two at the max uh, shorter lectures looking at diseases focused on the biliary tree. Well, I have kept you for almost an hour. I hope you've enjoyed this one. We've looked at some absolutely great lesions, and uh, I encourage you to go out to like places like the Wednesday Slide Conference, where most of these conditions, aflatoxicosis, pyrolizidine, have been uh, uh, have been reviewed a number of times. There's some fantastic write-ups out there um, on the molecular stuff, which I rarely get to talk about um, in these gross lectures. And I certainly will uh, recommend everybody go to the JPC and look some of these diseases up in the Wednesday Slide Conference or in VISPO and get a lot more detail because a lot of stuff I don't get to talk about. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you again at the uh, Foundation Facebook page or YouTube channel.